the Thoughty Orty podcast. I think it would be really useful to talk about sort of like a another aspect of stimming, which I think for some people it can be uh, sort of like a, a sensitive issue, you know, particularly for me. What I'm talking about is, is sort of harmful stimming. And, you know, for me specifically when I'm having a bad time, when I'm having a, a meltdown, for me, I, I have quite a lot of harmful stims. And it's, you know, a lot of the time when I when I do those harmful stims, whether it's like hitting myself or pinching myself or you know, hitting myself against something. It's it's almost always in a situation when it's it's a very, very intense meltdown or I'm in a place and I don't feel safe and there's no sort of place or there's no sort of aid for me to kind of, you know, uh, I don't have a safe place to, to go to and I don't really see any way that I can sort of fulfill those those needs that I have, that sort of regulation need that I have. And also, particularly during during times when I'm feeling very down or when I'm feeling very negatively about myself and typically in, in very sort of low self-esteem moods. It, it tends to be the case that that kind of thing happens. I know that there's things that are within sort of the harmful stimming label that could be perhaps relatively quite innocuous, like biting your nails or like whatever would be a good one. Pulling your hair or... Pulling your hair is... is I would not call that innocuous. No, no. You mean like tugging no. your hair or like pulling tugging your, your hair? hair oh. Tugging your hair. Okay. Yeah. Like, you know, just, just, like, <laughs> t- just like plucking hairs out of your hand or something. <laughs> um, or, or scratching or doing stuff like that. But I, I also think that, you know, con- considering that there's, there's such a sort of a big overlap between um, autism and, and mental health conditions, you know, particularly for me when I was a lot younger, it was um, the case that a lot, a lot of the stimming that, that I did, the way that I um, sort of dealt with my emotional difficulties and, and overwhelm from the day was, you know, things related to like self-harming, which was, you know, it's, um, no, and I, I think a lot of people that I've talked to have sort of shared that, that kind of feeling. And I guess, I guess what I want to sort of know is I, I've given a lot of examples and I've kind of taken a bit of the, the lead on it. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately and, um, um, especially sort of looking back on my past, it's, um, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, Jesus. Um, it is a really important topic. It's a really big topic and it's one that I also have personal experience with. And I think pulling from what you said, you actually brought up a lot of different ways that not just like the way it looks, but different moments when people might self injuriously stem. And so Mm -hmm. I, I want to bring some of that to the surface that there is a difference between a self injurious stem that is not related to a feeling of anxiety or overwhelm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a self-injurious stem that is related to trying to regulate during a moment of self of anxiety and overwhelm or overload. And there's also a difference between that and self-injurious stemming during a meltdown. Yes. Yeah. So during a meltdown, I don't think that there's really – if I've come to the point of having a meltdown, I'm no longer really in control of like what stems or what actions I am taking. So yes. if I only say if I were a person who only self injuriously stemmed during meltdowns, my focus then would not be on how do I stop self injuriously stemming during meltdowns? My focus sure. would be how can I put in systems, supports, and boundaries so that I can practice proactive meltdown prevention. 
That would be Very my good focus point. there. If I am self injuriously stimming just because like this I think is rare, but it just because it's like the thing that I do. Like it's not connected to overwhelm or I'm, I'm the same with biting my nails. Like I, I love mm-hmm. biting my nails. Yeah. <laughs> and- so then yeah. I would say just looking for a replacement stem mm-hmm. that meets that same need. So I sucked my fingers. I sucked my, these two fingers here since I was born. Like it's a joke mm-hmm. that I like, came out doing that. And I did not stop until the summer between the fifth and sixth grade mm-hmm. because it was meeting my needs and I was really happy. And I did it when I was born. I did it when I was, I did it when I was happy. I just did it because it was getting me sensory input, proprioceptive input is what it actually is that I needed. Now, however, society is not really accepting of children after a certain age, sucking a thumb, sucking their fingers, using a pacifier. So it was a big battle to try to get me to stop. And I was even like, at some point having gloves taped to my hand in an attempt to make me stop. I had like my fingers taped together, things like that in an attempt to make me stop. It wasn't like evilly intended. So I'm not mad at the folks who did that to me, but I think it just helps us to consider how stigmatized stemming is that it would be like normal to do that to a child who is sucking their fingers Eventually, I did recognize, okay, I'm going to have to stop this. Like, I'm getting bullied. I'm getting a lot of coercion. I'm getting people, like, punishments for this stim. So I'm going to need to stop. Now, does that mean that I just stopped and was like, I no longer need proprioceptive oral stim put. I mean, stim put. Stimming input. <laughs> Stim put. <laughs> nice. I'm gonna, uh, nice. I'm going to so trademark got, got that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is that is just a strike of genius. I like that. <laughs> no, that, so that didn't happen, right? I didn't suddenly yeah. just not need that mm-hmm. anymore. So I started to bite my nails. Now, yeah. you shouldn't bite your nails. Biting your nails is bad, right? So people kept telling me, stop biting your nails. They started I started getting the same reaction um, to me biting my nails. And it's like they, they, they stop you. They want to stop you from doing things, but they don't give you any alternatives. Yes. So I did stop biting my nails eventually, but I still needed that input. So I started taking my now long nails and slicing my gums with them to get proprioceptive oral stem yeah. put. I'm stem put. I said it again. It went, that wasn't on it purpose. For, <laughs> I was I, an accident. <laughs> I, yeah. I I also I, I want to add. It's not something that I that I've talked about before, but for me, I, I very much have something similar to that. Like like uh pressing pressing my nails against my my gums or like you know, for for a long time, I've had a real sort of love love hate back and forth relationship with like toothpicks, because you know, left to my own devices, I would just want to pick my teeth and gums all the time because mm-hmm. it's like such a it's such a big big sort of stim for me. It's it's very strange that you you're bringing up lots of things that I haven't like <laughs> I haven't like talked about before. It's 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 very feels very validating to me. Yeah, I mean, and I hope by us having this conversation and those who listen to it, I hope that they can see that they're not alone and that this is not something that we have to continue to put behind closed doors. Because if we don't talk about it, then we don't talk about the ways we can support others in it either. And so for me, in order to eventually stop the self-injurious stimming, because it it was painful. I wasn't like hating it, but it was painful. And there are negative side effects to doing that. And I think also in a way, you know, slicing my gums does, I think it opened an avenue for me to think of other 
like, okay, this pain is helping me. Even though it wasn't actually pain, I just wasn't given access to this like knowledge around proprioception and like all this stuff. So I thought it was pain. So I did wind up self-injuriously stemming also by getting proprioceptive input through slapping my arms. So mm-hmm. I had to really dial it back, really dial it back. And they got, I got tied into anxiety as well. Yeah. So I started yeah. like slapping my arms repeatedly when I had a lot of social anxiety or social overload or sensory overload that then caused me to have social anxiety. So mm-hmm. it was all getting wrapped up together. And I had to really dial it back to get to a place of realizing like, where did where did this come from? And it was like, I just wanted to suck my fingers. Like, so did I start, (laughs) (laughs) did I start sucking my fingers again? No, but I did start looking for replacement stems that would meet those proprioceptive needs. So Mm. chewing gum, um, jewelry, and um, drinking fizzy drinks and drinking hot drinks that would stimulate um, that area. Um, I have weighted blankets now. I, you know, have things that I hug all the time, plushies and and things like that. So getting a lot of those things into my life, figuring out what worked for me. Now it wasn't magical because habits, repetition can lead to mm-hmm. habit, and habits are difficult to change. And yeah. once it got tied to social anxiety. And social anxiety is very common for many autistic individuals. I want to clarify that I no longer really experience social anxiety, um, but I did have it severely. I did experience it severely from like fifth grade until I was like 27. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm 31 now. So that was you just like not. A, I am. No, you're not. What? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I am 31. <laughs> and it's funny being on social media and being 31 and having people think you're a lot younger. and Or me being like, I was diagnosed at 23. And people are like, congratulations. Like, how's it been? And I'm like, well, <laughs> it was eight years ago. So it's oh been a God. lot of a journey. Do you really no want way. to hear all that? 